The Money Mystery, Chapter 7, The Grain Embargo Dear Chris, In retaliation for the invasion of Afghanistan, the Carter administration prohibited American farmers from selling grain to the Soviet Union. Mr. Carter threatened additional grave consequences if the Soviet troops did not immediately withdraw. The theory was that these pressures would cause the Soviets to leave Afghanistan. Stability would be restored. But the application was not quite so neat as the theory. The embargo and accompanying vague threats blew the lid off the currency markets. Around the world, people began to fear the U.S. officials would pressure their allies into freezing all Soviet bloc assets. At that time, Soviet bloc debt to Western banks totaled some $80 billion. Knowledgeable investors began to realize that if Soviet bloc assets were frozen, the Soviet bloc governments would be unable or unwilling to repay this debt. With financial markets already in turmoil, an $80 billion default hitting dozens of large banks worldwide could set off a global bank run and financial crash every bit as bad as 1929. Investors were also aware that each government would be tempted to try to bail out its banks by rapidly printing money and giving this money to the banks by hyperinflating. All banks and currencies everywhere were now threatened by Mr. Carter's actions. No paper money of any type was trusted. The demand for all paper money plunged and the demand for gold and silver skyrocketed. On January 31st, 1980, the Wall Street Journal quoted Hans Bauer, chairman of Bank Julius Bauer in Switzerland. Put bluntly, the main reason for the gold price explosion is the Iranian assets freeze. And after Afghanistan, people fear that there could be some joint assets freeze by NATO. This leaves only gold and silver. This panic carries a latent danger of a loss of confidence in the entire system. Day after day, the financial panic grew. The demand for paper money plunged. Gold rose to $850 and silver to $50. But few people understood what was happening because few understood velocity or the demand for money. Most news people had their gaze fixed firmly on the supply of money, and since this supply was not increasing rapidly, they assumed the exploding gold and silver prices were an anomaly. The Fed did the only thing it could do. To offset the declining demand for the dollar, it tightened monetary policy, stopping expansion of the money supply. Then it tightened further, triggering a deflation. The tightening was reinforced by credit controls restricting the flow of money. Interest rates rose three full points in one month. To restore confidence in the dollar and stop the panicky flight from dollars, the Federal Reserve restricted the money supply. This drove interest rates up three full points in one month. Officials held their breath and waited, and waited. Finally, the panic began to subside, and precious metal prices broke downward. After a few weeks had passed, Investors lost their fear that the Carter administration would freeze Soviet bloc assets. The perceived risk of holding bank deposits and paper money began to decline, and the demand for paper money began to stabilize. Interest rates fell back. By May of 1980, the panic was over and paper money was again trusted, to some extent. As the London Times wrote, investors in any given country now understand gold is an asset. No other government can inflate, and no other government can block. And, as Business Week said, foreign bankers will neither forgive nor forget the panic of 1980. Restoring confidence in the dollar would take a long, long time. Uncle Eric. And we'll read Chapter 8 in the next video. Thanks so much for listening in. Hey, please reach down, click like, subscribe, and leave a comment. We'd love to hear from you. I love you guys, and as Tigger says, ta-ta for now.